to have you here. Uh, as promised today, we are talking about Curve. This is a recorded session. Hello, Marina. Happy to have you here today. Um, Hi, we're just getting started with our Define Menina's first official session of 2022. We already had a hello session last week. And then uh, we discussed some of the things that we want to be talking about. And this one is a particular session that it's going to be recorded for us just because we don't want anybody to miss anything. It's uh, going to be a bit complex in the beginning. Don't worry, it's mathematical stuff. Just look at the graphs, stay with me, some numbers, but then we're going to go to the protocol and understand why this protocol is pretty much important. So I'd like to start the journey by explaining like that a friend of mine invited me to talk to the Central Bank of Sweden in about like a year ago, a year and a half ago, in the end of October 2020. And that was like when DeFi was taking off like off the ground and becoming the, everybody wanted to talk about DeFi and he's like you know everything and you know what it's all about I'm like seriously Alex like there's you couldn't ask for a worse person to talk about DeFi I really think this is video game money I am a community person I just talked to developers I really couldn't care less about speculation but he put me in like this complicated role so at that time I had to do like a basic DeFi presentation. So I started by introducing myself. Um, I do have a degree in digital currencies, a master's degree of science from the University of Nicosia. I'm also a mobile dev. Uh, I was doing much more like uh, Flutter, uh, iOS, Android developments at the time. Right now, not so much. But I also do have a degree in business uh, from uh, University of uh, Fundação Getúlio Vargas in Brazil. So I consider myself like a finance person. 15 years trading desk, I was a trader, I did derivatives, I did OTC, I did private wealth management, portfolio management in the past, I worked at Wall Street, UBS, I was the head of the trading desk of Deltec Bank, which is today where um, a lot of the Tether is hosted. So pretty much that's, uh, I had an entire life of finance on my shoulders before I started with technology. And then at the time, I was just pretty much going to the basic, like market cap as of like the moment I was presenting, I would click and see the market cap at the time. I gave a real basic overview of what DeFi was all about. I spoke about the importance of Ethereum in this ecosystem. So Ethereum was the place where all the DeFi protocols were getting uh, plugged into. So that's why if we understand Ethereum, uh, the importance of Ethereum for the DeFi ecosystem is really, really huge. At that time, the total value of all the DeFi, like borrowing, lending, uh, decentralized exchanges, everything was around 11 billion. So from nothing to 11 billion, everybody was like, wow, this is huge now. So, and this graph got my attention because it was really like it took off from like July, June. It was almost nothing from like a couple of hundred millions to 300 millions to then like almost eight, nine million. And I didn't pay attention at the time. But if you see this last week here of October, there is this green line that explains that Uniswap, the light green one, became like from the dominant one to the not so dominant one anymore and Curve actually took off. At the time I never heard about Curve, so I absolutely ignored that. I'm like, Uniswap is what everything is all about. So I, I did a print screen of the biggest protocols at the time, right? And then I spoke about borrowing and lending first. So I spoke about Compound, Aave. Then I spoke about like what is actually P2P lending. I spoke a bit about collateral, oracles. So pretty much this was the presentation I did. In the end, after like I presented some risks, we if we had extra time, I would talk about the importance of like Uniswap, that they never did any kind of token raising ICO style, that they kind of gave an airdrop to the community. I would speak about the stability fee and what happened in the, the 
Thursday event of uh, MakerDAO, this flash crash that they had, they had. But then I also wanted to talk about the importance of like centralized intermediation as I was talking to like the biggest Swedish uh, 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 tech company at the time, right? So I would explain to them what's the difference between an electronic transaction that happens inside PayPal versus something that happens in Uniswap. And then we came to decentralized intermediation, which is pretty much smart contracts. Let me see if someone is... Hey, Marcella, we're getting recorded here. Hello, hello. You probably saw this one before. So uh, we're in the middle of like how I first ignored Curve completely. And then I finished the presentation talking about like the DeFi exchanges, the decentralized exchanges. And I literally had on the day of the presentation, Curve was the first, but I'm like, I don't even know what Curve is and the Central Bank of Sweden is never going to know. So I just took the, the slide, the, the screenshot I had the week before. So Uniswap was the biggest, 2 billion, and Curve had 1 billion total value lost. Long story short, I never continued in DeFi. I continued doing uh, community work. And then a year later, everybody was uh, talking about uh, AMMs and DeFi and conferences happened again. And then uh, I decided to then stop ignoring DeFi and started to understand that it would be stupid of me not to allocate brain capacity and time to understand and speculate. I had like two decades, almost like a decade and a half of finance background. And at this point, ignoring DeFi would be absolutely stupid. At the same time, my super good friend Marina here said, let's do this. We have to start investing. We have to start risking our capital. So pretty much, uh, Marina, if you have a minute or two just to say hello, but what crossed your mind when you invited me to do like a DeFi Menina's version zero, uh, back in November, maybe. <laughs> well, um, I think Juliana and I have been in a couple of DAOs and projects where it's all the talk, 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 and nobody actually clicks any buttons, and everybody has all this knowledge, but we don't know about it. And I think for me, it was really important that we start to make our capital work for ourselves, like the way that the dudes do it. Why aren't we doing it? Why aren't we putting, like, by the way... I got my new treasure, so now I can put all my stuff there, like you told me. Awesome. Um, and just like doing the things that I didn't even know that I should have my my MetaMask stuff on a treasure, not just on MetaMask, for example. And this is how we are talking and discussing and investing and doing stake DAO and paying a lot of fees, <laughs> but you know, being there and understanding and not missing out completely. I think it's really important. Um, I think I was kind of sad this week. I had an interview and it didn't go so well because it's like, well, what have you aped into it? How, how degen are you? I'm like, well, I think for a girl, I'm pretty degen. But it was kind of sad because it, it wasn't an opportunity that, that worked out, even though my job had nothing to do with aping in, by the way. Um, and I think I want to not have that problem anymore. And that's why I want to be here. And I hope that you guys are feeling the same, or maybe you guys can teach us. Absolutely. I think this is going to be a super cool partnership of friends. We started as like Marina and I, we never met. And we're like so good friends <laughs> for two years. So we met via Metagama Delta. Metagama Delta is a DAO that pretty much I'm very uh, uh, proud to say that I deployed from my computer at the time when Meta Cartel was also looking forward to stimulate more women and empower women to be part of that. And that's how I met Marina. Uh, we're obviously inviting more of the women that were part of Meta Gamma Delta. But at the same time, I understood how guys were aping. That's the term, aping like apes and ooh, 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 don't even know what I'm doing, but I'm just jumping from protocol to protocol to get APYs. And in this scenario, this is super cool because I talked to everybody in the crypto space and I met Jesus uh, back in the beginning of Meta Cartel's uh, like growth scene in the 
uh, the last one of the last conferences we had in 2020. And Jesus was 100% DeFi focused. And then when pandemic uh, reopened and we met again, then I met Jesus back in Paris. Uh, I think I met Marcella after Paris, probably just in Lisboa. But they are my right and left arm when I'm looking for proper information. So Marcella, really quick, they invited me this time to talk about anything I wanted to talk about in DeFi space in the end of uh, 2021 for their annual conference. And I thought talking about the history of Curve would be like a great idea. So really quick, Marcella, you're going to uh, be next to present on Wednesday. So just uh, hello, speak a bit about what's your role and how Crypto Plaza is this, this amazing community as well. Okay, thanks. Well, I, I think uh, many of you already know me, but so Christina is like, I am the CEO of Crypto Plus. Crypto Plus is the biggest uh, community of investors and startups here in Spain, in Southern Europe. And we have been, done, done a lot of work trying to educate new people, but it's true that most of the people that are in our community are guys and they're all now kind of digits and aping and they are very advanced. Sometimes it's not that we girls are not able to do it, but I think we work a bit different. But being here in this group is trying to all this knowledge that I'm learning with all these guys and everything. So we try to take it out to this group and see how we can all complement ourselves uh, trying to understand these DeFi protocols in our own way. I don't think we have to work the same way but maybe trying to do our thing and trying to learn from all of you. And of course, yes, I'm going to do the next session that's going to be on Wednesday. It's about Element uh, Finance. Uh, Element Finance is a fixed income protocol in DeFi. So uh, that's uh, what I'm going to explain. Of course, it's important to know many things, Curve is one of the protocols that you can use in this, but I think it's very, it's going to be very interesting. I hope I understand it very well. Of course, if you can read about something or want to know or ask, so you can ask questions, of course, and maybe we can invite someone from the protocol to explain things to us, or maybe Jesus can explain something to us later. So really exciting to hear this session with Juliana Badger. That is a protocol that I really like. So Juliana, please. So thank you, everyone. Super thanks, Marcella. Yeah, déjà vu for you. And excuse me that some slides are written in Spanish. I, I had to do for their community. So it's pretty much forced to speak Spanish, which was great. Uh, but uh, pretty much that's, that's the story. I took as much like a... Uh, a view about why this changed in one year. So this is the scenario in November 2020, all DeFi had 11 billion. A year later, just the decentralized exchanges had 32 billion. So something must have happened. And in this scenario of decentralized exchanges, almost 50% of that was curved. So, hello, how did this happen? How everybody talks about Uniswap and nobody would speak about Curve. And this was November 2020. Again, Uniswap, the leader, 2 billion total value bought, and half of it was Curve. Balancer right after with 465 million. And then November 2021, we had Curve with 15 billion and Uniswap the second position with half of the assets. So it's not that it was like... Are you already showing slides? Excuse me? Are you already showing slides? I am. Oh, well, thank you. No. <laughs> <laughs> let, me, let me go back again. So pretty much we had 11 billion in DeFi and then 32 billion total value locked in the in the DeFi ecosystem, just decentralized exchanges. So here's curve dominance. 
And then this is what was happening a year before, and this is what was happening late November. So pretty much it's not that Uniswap was even close, it was just half of the 15 billion. So this is a, a journey that was kind of like hard at this point to catch up with the leader. So pretty much uh, to understand what happened, I needed to read the white paper of Curve. And it's a very complex, like you give up in the second paragraph because it starts to get so mathematical that you almost like forget about it. I'm not going to understand the technical value behind of it. But uh, understanding Uniswap is pretty much understanding this equation. Understanding liquidity versus two tokens. Token X and token Y. And if you multiply token X by token Y, you get a constant K. So imagine always having this proportion in a liquidity pool. Every time you uh, raise the supply of token A, the token B must diminish because you take liquidity out of the pool. So for this constant to keep happening, one must move in opposite direction than the other. So the biggest, the order size, the highest the slippage will happen to the user, causing impermanent loss. So for smaller trades, meaning something around one or two ETH in a big pool, that's all right. Someone at home will never take all the liquidity of a pool. But if an institution-sized whale comes to this market, they can absolutely deplete all the funds of a pool. And this equation, again, uh, this is just an example, but imagine a pool with 25,000 ETH and 62 and a half million die. For this equation to happen, you have to multiply one by the other, which gives us this big billionaire constant. So this constant will be the exact same. So if I take one ETH out of my 25,000 ETH pool, I will end up with 24,999 ETH and I to get this constant still valid, the new die reserve will be a bit higher. So I paid more or less 2,510 cents per die per ETH that I that I got out of the out of the pool. This is almost like no slippage. It doesn't make a big deal. If I do this for 10 ETH, I will have a slightly different price which will be around the price per die can be around 25,000 per ETH. So, uh, sorry, 2,501. So instead of 2,510 cents, I will have a 0.04% slippage, which is still acceptable, right? It's not a big deal. 100 ETH, I would have a slippage of 0.40. The problem is when I get almost all the ETH out of this pool. Imagine I'm a whale and I get 20 ETH out of 20, uh, 20,000 ETH out of 25,000 uh, ETH in the pool. So I almost get all the ETH out. I will leave only 5,000 ETH available in the pool. For my constant to be the same, I will need to have uh, 32 uh, 312 uh, million die available. And my die cost will be around 12,500 per ETH. So imagine to every ETH that I bought out of this pool will have an average cost per die of 12,500, which gives me a slippage of 400% which makes it almost impossible for me to continue in this pool anymore. Like all the ETH is gone. I need to get more ETH back. So this equation is amazing, but it caused impermanent losses. And that is the unfortunate story of Uniswap V2. Massive amount of, um, of um, impermanent losses. The second scenario is, uh, so when you have uh, this uh, constant product market maker, 
you have this problem of extreme um, uh, problems of liquidity when it gets to the, the extreme scenarios. So right here, this is very efficient. As we take almost all the dye or almost all the eat out of my pool, I have ridiculously unrealistic prices and this cannot happen. The other uh, mathematical model for a possible liquidity pool is a liquidity pool that provides zero slippage. So that's the opposite, where token A plus token B or X plus Y will equal my K, right? So it will be my constant K will be the result of the sum of the two one. So this allows someone that has access to off-chain. So if I go to an exchange, and I have something different than I can get in this pool. If I have a better price in the exchange where I can buy in the exchange and sell in the pool or buy from the pool and sell it in the exchange, I can automatically take all the money off the pool and go away. So this doesn't work for DeFi in general because liquidity cannot be drained completely. So this model would be efficient uh, zero slippage. However, we need liquidity. We cannot just let the mercy of, uh, of uh, the AMM not to work. So this model is like not okay. When finally uh, we got Balancer in the game, Balancer was the first one to allow more than two tokens in a different pool. So right now we're not talking about just token A and B. And we could have a pool where we have 80, 20, 60, 40. So they use the different constants here that I'm not going to go into uh, a lot of details, but this is the constant mean market maker, which is also way more efficient and allows different uh, kinds of swaps between the assets of the pool. So again, Balancer is uh, around 2 billion uh, in November, market cap number four. So you will hear a lot more about Balancer in the future because their model has uh, this, this efficient. When finally we get to the stable swap invariant, which is an exact mix between the constant sum and the constant product. So if my portfolio is relatively balanced between token A and token B or token X and token Y, I will operate under constant sum. When I get like 90% of token A and 10% of token B, then I am not as balanced anymore. And then I switch my model to constant product model. So pretty much what it does is it exposes the liquidity pool to risk adjusted uh, scenario and it reduces the, the slippage to the traders. So you have way less slippage in case you want big liquidity and large sums of liquidity. So what they did was that they flattened the curve. You want to be as close as possible to this zero slippage uh, red line over here, which is the constant price, uh, where x plus y equals a constant. However, you cannot get depleted uh, liquidity, but also you don't want to have the largest uh, um, slippage as possible. That's the case that was happening in Uniswap V2. So pretty much they could flatten the curve and they operate under scenario A or scenario B, depending off the pool and the pricing and all that. So they almost have like a switch that converts from one model to the other whenever it means is efficient. So this pure mathematical model allowed curve to take all the liquidity to their protocol in a matter of days. This was not a vampire attack. This was not marketing. This was pure mathematics. And they create uh, deeper pockets of liquidity, as they call. By doing that, they reduce the price slippage in the specific trading range, and they reduce the impermanent loss. So you get the three best scenarios and three advantages in this model. And this is absolutely, it was optimized for coins that tend to follow the same value. So for example, WBTC 
is different than SBTC that is different than RENBTC, but they all follow Bitcoin. So pretty much if wrapped Bitcoin is way below the Bitcoin price, you're going to buy a lot of wrapped Bitcoin and then unwrap it and have Bitcoin at a cheaper price. So arbitrage happens all the time, every second. Computer bots are doing this every minute. So pretty much for assets that are close in value, like for example, stable coins that are pegged to $1, like the DAI, the USDC, USDT, this is a great, um, this is a great protocol for that. So pretty much that was the scenario of Curve. Now, interesting enough is the fact that Curve is not the most user-friendly uh, protocol as well. People complain a lot of, all the time about their interface, that their interface is complicated. And I'm gonna tell something serious uh, to all of you here. I'm gonna stop sharing screen. When I used to work in finance, I had to look for best pricing execution for my clients. Regardless, if Deutsche Bank had the funniest app or Citibank, I could speak with the trader via chat. Whoever offered me the lowest price when I was buying, I would execute. So I am not a person that looks for the easiest uh, technology. It's not when, when blockchain started, there were so many different wallets and they were all saying how seamless experience this was. Just by clicking one button, you convert your dollars to Bitcoins and you would convert at ridiculously stealing robber prices because it's not because you click just an easy button that makes the price better. So we should look for the best price if we're buying and we should look for the best price if we're selling. We want to see the highest bidder if we're selling because we want to sell at the highest price as possible. And if we're buying, we want to buy at the lowest price as possible. So I want you to please ignore the fact that, oh, this UI is more friendly and I prefer the cow that does, like I love cow swap because the cow does that. So it's not about UI, it's about pricing. Our money is valuable. Our Price slippage matters. So if we have to insert price slippage manually to get a better deal, we are going to do this. We're gonna do this mathematical equation to get best price. I don't want someone to charge 1% on top of my trade if they can charge 0.2% on top of my trade, right? So I don't wanna give them commissions. Romina, you wanna say something? Yeah, yeah, I have a question. Mm -hmm. uh, let's say we, we want to look at different pools in, in Curify and we see there are several uh, different pools that somehow, sometimes have the same assets. So my first question would be, how do I pick the best pool? Uh, we briefly spoke about it in the past, but I think given this context, that it's helpful to repeat it again. And also, when I'm in a pool and the price moves and I want to go to the edge, uh, maybe I want to go to the edges, because then I have like the better the price movement for like the edge case, right? Uh, but what should I watch out for when, so that I know when's the best time to go in and when's the best time to go out? Because Uniswap V2 was, would still be attractive if you were inside in the right moment, right? It was just that you need to see the signals when it's time to leave the, the pool. Okay. So maybe you can help. So give some context. Important. Sorry, I'm taking it. Yes. Sorry. Yes. Can I ask? So, so I have like a very dumb question, like one step before that. So if I have, for example, USDT, so I will receive them from a friend doing like friend's business. So I need them on my MetaMask and then I can start like participating in the pools in uh, Curfy or, or how does it work? Do I need them on Binance? Yeah. Now I will explain what does it mean. Very stupid. Yeah, what does it mean to participate in a pool? Do you know, Katya? What does it mean to be in a pool or to? Yeah. So you so you 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 give your your assets. You make them work for you. So you kind of lock them and you receive yeah the percentage for that. So I I am. I'm participating as a fleet of I and as a grow XYZ, 
but curves, I just felt I, I had my issues with interface. <laughs> As you said, so it's like, okay, okay, cool. I can swap like die for like something else. And then, so I have like different like full options. Um, yeah, with like okay. different level of, um, yeah, the like, three words, but like, where do I start? <laughs> okay, so you have to understand the basic difference between a swap a stake and providing liquidity to a pool. When you stake a token, it's almost like I'm going to Citibank, I'm going to buy a certificate of deposit and I'm going to leave my money at Citibank to earn interest rates in the end of the year. When you do this at Lido, you stake your ETH and you get rewarded in the form of interest to get your money back after each period of time. You can stake and you can unstake. When we swap coins, we swap one coin for the other. The same way we swap euros per dollars, Japanese yen for dollars, right? There is a rate and there is a, a, a price that is interesting. I'm going to, if I have Japanese yen and I want to sell, I want to get the most amount of dollars for my Japanese yen. The same with any token pair. Right, regardless of the token pairs as possible. When we provide liquidity, we act as the casino, as the banks. We are the ones giving our tokens to a pool so the pool traders can do trades with our money. Right? So when we provide liquidity to a pool, we either give the two tokens or just one token and say, Go ahead, do trades. What we care about is that we get a lot of trading fees, right? So we want a pair that trades and, and flows all the time. Our magic word here is called liquidity. And I'm going to start uh, explaining uh, Romina's question. When I look at Curve or when I look at any protocol, the first measure is do I have liquidity? Liquidity meaning, is there money over there? Am I going to provide money to a pool that has $100? I have way more risk than, if, let's say, if I give $80 of liquidity because I'm going to be the biggest liquidity provider of a very small pool. But if I go to a pool party where there's lots of people and lots of participants and that pool trades all the time, my risk is uh, lowered because there are more liquidity providers. So in terms of money or in terms of uh, decentralization. So both things matter. The amount of participation, meaning the amount of people that are locking their tokens over there and the amount of money. This will get easier as we see this right now. I'm gonna share screen again with all of you. Welcome ladies to curve.fi. What is the first thing we see here? We see their homepage and we see that they are not only in Ethereum, in Arbitrum, Avalanche, Phantom, Harmony, Polygon, XDAI, you name it. All the networks are here. What is the difference between them? Liquidity. The pool volumes have lower volumes in the other networks versus mainnet. So the first thing I do when I come to Curve is see all pools. This is what 99% of the people do. Let me see how the parties are happening. Imagine if this is each room of a big party and this party is happening in a house. So where is the music playing louder? I like to see the 24 hour daily volume, right? So around 76 million is changing hands between Tether, Bitcoin, and, and Wrapped Ethereum. Around 162 million is changing hands just in stable coins on mainnet. Think about that, 162 million in the past 24 hours. That's a lot of changing hands. Let's click this pool over here which is the one that has DAI, USDC, and USDT. 
don't worry about this not being the most beautiful UI in the world. There is 162 million overnight changing hands and there is 5 billion 735 million dollars of DAI, USDC and Feather locked in this pool. 5.7 billion dollars is locked in this pool. Is this a big number for you to provide liquidity? Yes, I mean, it's more than the European, the balance sheet of the European Central Bank. <laughs> okay, so what is 5.7 billion? Let me make this bigger here. This means 1.8 billion DAI is there, 1.8 billion USDC is there, and 1.9 Tether is there, providing liquidity in the proportions of 32.9, 32.4, 34.6. Okay, so 5.7 billion is mainnet money. Oh, gas is so expensive on mainnet. If I'm a big bank and I want to provide, I want to play the DeFi Fiesta party, of course, I'm, I'm going to have like a purpose to come to a pool that is a big pool. If I am, need to change $10, this is okay, but if I need to change $10 million, I need a bigger pool to change $10 million, right? So when I go back to root, most people like, what is that? You see that here, change from home to tri-pool. The tri-pool, tri-pool or tri-pool, whatever that is, is the DIUSDC USDT, okay? So if you see tri-curve or tri-pool, they usually mean this one. The tri curve, if I'm not wrong, and when I go back to root, I go back home. So those are just names that are like, oh, gonna try, drive you crazy, but these are each one of the pools, okay? On my left side, there is like a, a lot of the pools. This is not fun to click this button and try to see one by one. That's why we go to see all pools. Another magic button that we can click is the volume one. Oh, we click volume, we can go from no volume to biggest volume. And biggest volume right now is the Tri Crypto. So this had 5.7 billion and traded 162 million overnight. This traded way less, but let's see how much money they have between Tether, ETH, and BTC here. They don't have that much they have 867 million only so um, it's not a lot it's not a lot but this is the amount uh, this is the dollar amount equivalent sorry that's uh, in this pool so pretty much I don't understand why it didn't show like by volume it should have shown this one first anyways another very important measure for apes. Apes like interest. They like rewards and they want the highest reward for their money. Highest rewards, highest risk. So usually you can go for the base APY, which is the amount of APY you can get if you provide liquidity to this pool. So this pool will give me 4.7% per year. But it will give me some extra rewards. So here, if you press here, you can see the lowest rewards versus the highest rewards. You just click once, click twice, it changes the, the filter here. It goes from lowest to highest or highest to lowest, right? The same with volume. And all I'm doing, I'm just pressing buttons. So to make it easy, every time my mouse goes from arrow to mini hand means, oh, there's a button here I can click. Oh, there's something here I can insert data, right? Oh, there's a button here I can click. So it's okay to start pressing buttons. And even here, oh my God, what if I press sell? Am I gonna sell? Of course not. It's gonna call your MetaMask for you to allow MetaMask to sell. So don't worry about, even if you press the buy or sell button, this is not super automatic in the first click that you're gonna get your transaction executed. Right. So pools are very, very important that we see the liquidity. So yeah, let's say we go to Polygon now. Polygon is a very well-known decentralized exchange, right? It will ask my MetaMask to switch to Polygon and I'm all right to give that permission. Let's say I'm, 
I'm going to trade. The same thing I'm going to do, see all pulls. And then under volume, uh, if I look for the DAI USDC USDT, I'm not going to have the same amount of, uh, of liquidity locked as I have on mainnet. So even though this is a real big mix between stable coins and non-stable coins, we can see that the volume sitting there of 99 million is way lower than 5.7 billion on mainnet. So when we are going to give liquidity to a pool, we are going to see how big is the party. We don't want to be in a party where four people dominate the game and we're going to be the fifth one. Because if the four decide to leave the pool, you're going to be like alone and, and no more rewards and no more like the pool is over. So you need to look for liquidity. Unfortunately, gas prices are ridiculous right now. There is nothing we can do about that. But if we want to be cautious and think about long term, then paying the gas price to enter and to exit is something we're going to do one time to enter and one time to exit. Apes enter and exit all the time. So for aping, this is not the best scenario. You don't want to be on mainnet if you want to be aping from highest APY to another highest APY. Because every time you take out your liquidity, you unstake your liquidity. So I'm going to give an example here of uh, if I would enter a pool on uh, Avalanche, for example, it would ask my MetaMask to change to Avalanche. Okay, I'm going to connect my wallet here to Avalanche. And then it just says connect to Avalanche. Okay, switch network. Now I'm on Avalanche. Immediately I see Curve Avalanche logo on top. This is how I know I'm not on mainnet anymore. I am on Curve Avalanche anymore. The interface looks exactly the same. However, the money is completely different. The APYs are completely different. And now I get Wavax as rewards to give liquidity to pool X, Y, or Z. Let's say I have Frax, okay, or see all pools, right? Let's say I have Frax in my wallet and I want to get 2.47% a year. I have the option of depositing Frax, DAI, USDC or USDT in this pool. So here is buy and sell is if I want to swap. So this is like CowSwap or Uniswap when you just swap the tokens. If you want to provide liquidity to a pool, you're going to press deposit because then you are depositing your coins, right? Let's say I had a hundred uh, die here. I will deposit that in the pool. So I can deposit a uh, uh, hundred of each. I can deposit a thousand of tether. I can deposit just tether. I can deposit in different ways I possibly want. I, I don't need to have four tokens to participate in this pool. I just need to have one of them and I can put as much as I want, right? So the deposit is, is here. When you give your liquidity to the pool. So what happens is that this pool is telling me that they have a very interesting amount of like 60% almost of uh, DAI USDC USDT, which is called the tri-curve um, uh, avalanche uh, portion and 41% of frax. So for this pool to be balanced 50-50, they would need to have like more or less 25% FRAX, 25% DAC, DAI, 25%, or balance between FRAX and others. FRAX and others, perfect balance would be 50% FRAX and 50% others. So this would be the deposit one. And then you can deposit and stake on curve mainnet is a little bit different than avalanche because you can then after you deposit in a pool you get something called lp token lp liquidity pool token is a token so you get an lp token you're gonna hear this name all the time oh what do i do with my lp token what is lp token 
it's like a certificate of deposit that you allow the pool to play with your money and do trades. You want the pool to flow all the time. It's almost like if you're gonna open a Cambio exchange in an airport, you really wanna be in JFK or in Heathrow, so people from all over the world come and bring cash and change dollars to euros or Japanese yen to, uh, to dollars, right? So you really want to be in a busy place, so you get fees based on the amount of people changing hands all the time. So liquidity matters a lot. So may I ask something? Yes. Go ahead. Uh, uh, yeah, it, it's. Uh... I'm going with the theme. If we could go to those pools on uh, Ethereum on, cur on Curve, and uh, we could see uh, the the pool Curve plus Ethereum that has 4.7% uh, and volume eight, eight uh, almost $9 million, and the other one on the third place is 3.24 and $10 million, uh, in volume. Uh, so the difference between volumes and between API, uh, APYs is like, you know, it's it's different, right? But not in, in, in a uh, big way. So uh, what would you, on first place, recommend to look at volume or APY if, if it's, you know, it's uh, yeah. not like uh, I, a big change? I think over. the first thing you think is like, what do I have in my wallet that is doing nothing? Example, I have Gnosis token in my wallet. What can I do with that? It's just sitting in my wallet doing nothing. I can stake Gnosis or I can provide liquidity for people to buy and sell Gnosis this following year. So, meaning that if I have GNO token, I want to look at liquidity pools on SushiSwap, on Balancer, on Uniswap, and let's say I have 10 GNO tokens, right? Which one will give me the highest APY? And how much liquidity is sitting in this pool? So first you look at what you have before you give liquidity. Mm -hmm. If you have USDC, you have so many options, so many options. All over the world, people will take your, your USDC and you can stake USDC and provide liquidity. But if you have an exotic pool, for example, I have house token from Dow House. I earn that and I'm providing liquidity on XDAI because I cannot provide liquidity on mainnet for that token. That token doesn't exist yet on mainnet. Everybody's providing liquidity on Swapper. So I don't have a choice. I have to go to Swapper if I want to earn some money with my tokens. Yeah, but uh, so you, you do not uh, exchange tokens just for providing liquidity, uh, liquidity, and uh, for earning those APYs, right? So it's just kind of a more. If you have something that you do not use at the time, you just pull them. Uh, I mean, put them. But uh, you know, uh, I have like a portfolio of some coins, and uh, just uh, sometimes I just uh, exchange them just to put them in in, in uh, liquidity pools, right? So I'm not sure now if it's right or yeah. uh, you know, let's, wrong way let's to, say to you're earn earning, money. Let's say you're earning 4.57% in the liquidity pool for having USDC with Aave. Mm -hmm. And now there's another pool that is providing you 15% for you to stake USDC with um, butterfly token. Okay. Mm -hmm. So that butterfly token is something that you can lose your USDC because people can swap all the time, back and forth. Yeah. So you would be okay a year from now to say, oh, I don't have USDC anymore. People bought all the USDC of the pool, but I have Aave and I'm happy to have Aave back. Yeah. But for that, if nothing happens, you get 457%. However, if you provide liquidity, for uh, USDC butterfly, USDC is drained from the pool. You end up with butterfly. And now mm -hmm. what can you do with freaking butterfly? But yeah. you got 15%, meaning that was a way better APY. And that made you move. Oh, I'm earning 4% a year. 
I want to earn 15% a year. I want to earn 1,000% a year. There are stories of fools that are now earning much more percent per year. So this is something we're going to see in the next session about yield aggregator and understanding the logic. But the logic is always how much will it cost me in gas for me to unstake? If I have to press a button and that button pressing will cost me $300 and I have to press another button to deposit on the other side and it's going to cost me another $300. I already have $600 cost of gas to take money from here to earn there. Now, I don't want to change my mind next week. So if you're providing liquidity, you're providing at this scenario of mainnet with a long run vision. And I guess- I want to be kicked out of the pool, like on Uniswap 3, right? Which I did. I mean, <laughs> I was kicked out of the pool, yeah. Yes, it can Yeah, happen. I lost like about $200 on that thing, I think, yeah. We all did. We all did. We all suffered impermanent losses because yeah. we put Ethereum die or we put something volatile with something stable. We should never mess the two. If we're doing stable coins scenario, we look at the currency that will not swap. Worst case, I get out of USDC, a year from now I get DAI and they're all one-to-one, -one, so I'm happy to get DAI back and I deposited USDC. However, if you put ETH with the stable coin, then you got to understand that if it's interesting, people are going to buy your stable coin out of you and you will get ETH that it was worth 4,000 when you deposited, now it's worth 3,000 this week. And this week we had a lot of volatility. So this, this week is a very interesting example of, yes, money flies very fast. In moments of instability, you don't want to care about how much gas you pay. I saw YouTubers pay $560. It's like, whatever, I just need to get this done. Yeah, but they were doing $600,000 transactions. If you're doing $600,000, who cares about $600? Right. So it's with this mentality that you have to think with this institutional mentality of big volumes, of big chunks of money that we need to think about. What is the common logic? If price falls, everybody will sell more. Or this is interesting for me to be the first brave one to be buying that when there's a monster wave coming tsunami of sellers. Am I going to be the, the brave buyer? Or I'm just going to let the wave continue and then buy, even if I buy at a worse price, but when I know the market is coming up. So it's all this logic that makes you decide between getting out of a position and entering another. Because when you do that, you got to have the conviction of, I'm not happy to be making 5% per year. 5% is way too low. I want to get more. What kind of risks are you going to have to take to get more money? Right. And I think that was the curve session for today. So again, never ever, I'll share my screen again, never be afraid of exploring this website. Uh, I'm going back to the when I'm lost and I don't know where to go. Like, oh, how do I go back to mainnet? I don't want to withdraw. I don't want to like uh, root. Root is the best. And then you will see network, go back to Ethereum. And in the main net, in Ethereum network, you will have statistics. Statistics are amazing. Daily statistics. Like people don't even think about pressing those buttons. But this is where you see liquidity. This is where you see volume. How did the compound curve pool behave? How did, for example, like pool number, whatever, whatever, this one. DUSD curve. Oh, six months ago. How was this pool? Year to date, this is just not so many, uh, much data, but a year ago from January 10th, 2021 from now, right? So how did this pool behave? What is the most recent APY? Oh, only nine basis points per year. That's not a lot. What is the daily trading volume? Zero. Do I want to be in a pool that never trades? How am I going to make trading fees if nothing trades? 
I'm here to provide liquidity to something that trades. So liquidity is a valuable asset that most protocols don't have. So protocols need to buy liquidity. They need to pay for liquidity. And they pay for liquidity with incentives. This is topic for another stories, but this is what we're doing here. We're going to understand how protocols are nothing and they become tradable coins and well-known coins and listed on Binance and CoinGecko and CoinMarketCap because people then trade their tokens and buy their tokens and sell their tokens. So we want trading volume to happen. When we are in Curve, we are part of the banking system. We're part of the casino. We want this casino to be everyday people coming in and out. In DAO, we can understand voting system, which is gauges and understanding how bribing works, creating locks, letting your tokens locked for a couple of years. So this is another story of depositing your LP tokens inside Curve and voting for the incentives, the liquidity incentives to go to your pool. So this is also another story. So if you go to DAO, you can see how you can vote under Curve. Contracts, you can see all the contracts that are here and all the real uh, um, official um, mainnet or um, layer two addresses. So where they were deployed, they were deployed with a specific address. You can then audit, verify, was this audited before, was it not? So here, Twitter, Telegram, Telegram China, like there is a lot. Developer docs, Dune Analytics. Dune Analytics, you get like so much out of that. You can see total active users, uh, how much percent, how, how is the curve token behaving right now, how much of it is locked, who are the biggest uh, lockers and, and who's holding, who's not holding. Trading fees per day, like, okay, we're talking about $39,000 in one day of just of trading fees. This is like a lot of money in the end of the month to be distributed back to token holders, right? So all these statistics, they all come from Curve Fi Exploring. So this website is your friend. It doesn't bite. Buttons are like kind of fancy in their way, right? Resembling Windows 98 probably, but it's all right. They, they don't do anything wrong if you click on them. I would rather have you clicking and then not approving a transaction on MetaMask, but learning and exploring than not clicking. Oh, here, advanced options, what's that? Oh, slippage. Slippage is default 1%, but what if I, I want half percent? What if I don't want half percent, I want 0.2%? Then you go here and you press 0.2%. Oh, 0.2, okay. What if I do 0.1? 0.1, maximum slippage value is likely too low and that transaction may fail. Okay, it may fail. Is it going to fail? I don't know. I pay gas, as a, a friend of mine just says, it's tuition fee just to know if it's going to fail or not. So gas is almost like a cost of like, let me try because if it doesn't fail, I pay very lo uh, low slippage. However, it may fail. So to be covered, I would just put 0 0.2. 0 0.2 is one-fifth of 1%. 1 so I really want to pay as low as possible. Oh, gas. Gas is fast. What is standard gas? What is slow gas? 1.1. What if I press 0 0.8? Is that all right? So you can try to press these buttons and that's all right. So every time you try something new here, it's going to be a, an amazing learning curve. So this is just to swap. You can go and swap from Tether to ETH, but today the best alternative is still Paraswap or CowSwap because it will guide you to where the best price is. However, you can always just make a simple swap, the buy and sell here instead of providing liquidity. So providing liquidity to the pool is deposit. That's when you give liquidity. And you will see two buttons, deposit and deposit and stake. With the deposit button, you get your LP token to you in your wallet. And you can stake 
wherever you feel like. So what we did with stake down, we deposited, we took our LP token, and then we went to stake down and staked in stake down. Here you stake inside the curve. Okay, so you can deposit or deposit in stake. This is a little bit higher in gas. However, in one transaction, you deposit and you stake. Can I just stake half percent and then the other half take to stake DAO? Absolutely. If you get, let's say, 88 LP tokens, you can stake 44 with Curve and then 44 with Avalanche stake DAO. Or like you can do 44 or you can do 88 with Curve directly or 88 with stake DAO directly. I'm giving stake DAO as an example, but we're going to okay, see so many other options. <coughs> I, I wanted to check in with you as well because we, we talked about slippage and we talked about all, all the things that went wrong this week. And we also saw, for example, that in Avalanche, uh, that with the stake DAO, there was one big deal. Like, how do we check in and see if everything is still okay or if it's time to get out? Like, what what is, um, how do I make sure I'm okay? <laughs> and, or if I'm at risk? Because at this point, we've staked in the mainnet and in Avalanche, but I don't know what's, like, how do we keep track of what's happening? You go back to the page and see how many tokens you have. Each position in finance in general is quantity times price. How is the, qu the quantity will not change because you got X tokens, but the price of those tokens, it varies up and down. So market was volatile, this couple of weeks, you probably lost value in price. So they're worth less likely. So your APY is still gonna be likely the same in one year from now. However, the value of the underlying token might go down. The same way with the bond. You can buy a treasury bond and you get, let's say, half percent in the end of the year. But if the underlying value is lower, you redeem at a lower price. Redeeming meaning you go back and you sell and you convert it back to cash, right? So if you do nothing, it's almost like you don't execute the loss. It's like, oh, I bought Apple stock. Apple stock is now less than the money I paid. I'm having a loss, but I didn't really realize the loss. You only realize the loss once you sell it. And then you're like, okay, I'll take it. I lost 10% of my amount invested, right? So there is no surprise. If you have a portfolio, it's almost like having babies. <laughs> My friend Geraldine just said, you need to watch out how many babies can you take care of or how many turtles can you take care of because you need to have an eye. So if some portfolio is just like buy and forget it there, three years from now, I'm going to take a look. Great. Hopefully, Ava is going to be here three years from now. Who knows? Right? So if you stake with Aave and Dai, you're hoping that those protocols are not going to be rug pulled in the next two, three years. So this is something that for the long run, you need to keep an eye on, but always paying attention to market movements. Yes, Federal Reserve, release the minutes, inflation was already here, it will happen. They said they would uh, raise the rates, the Fiesta is slowly finishing, they're playing Frank Sinatra right now. So economy will slow down. All that matters for crypto. People think that crypto is in another bubble, but it's not. It's risky capital. If people have a position in Citibank and they need to cover their assets, they need to sell their crypto to convert back to dollars and go back to Coinbase, to go back to deposit their, their, in their bank accounts to then liquidate some real world positions. Let's talk like that. So the correlation is, is together again. It's not that like crypto is in a different sphere of that nothing to do with what's no, happening in the world. Yeah. Um, yeah, that would be my quick question as well. Like how often are you supposed to check in like once every three days? I don't know, every week, every month. Marcella, how I often mean, do gens check their screens or their phones? Like all day. Like. 10 times per minute, maybe? Like they don't work, they just check them. <laughs> All the time. No, that, I, I think that's why you're always like checking out how's the price going because you never know in the day how it's going to be. So I think they are all day 
It depends more on how risky you are in, in your position, of course. Because the more your risk, the more you have to be there. So maybe if you go to like a liquidity pool that you can be like more safe, that is not that risky because you are just like going for like the big interest rate and you're just going like for the safe one where you know there is a lot of liquidity in that pool, then you can be like a bit more relaxed and you can see like, I don't know, few days, I don't know, some days in the week. But I think if you're going to take the big risk, you have to be very careful and be there like not 24 7 but yes like many times in the day maybe because of course we all know that pricing crypto goes up and down very quick sometimes you i don't know like these days it's been like crazy like this and of course if you are like in a very risky liquidity pool you have to be like very quick to react to go out or to put more liquidity so it depends on, on the risk, I think so. But I don't know, Juliana. No, absolutely. I would say it's comparing like a three-year-old children with my plant over here. I give water to my plant sometimes every 10 days, sometimes once a week, and she's super all right. She's living, she's beautiful. But a three-year-old, you cannot like lose an eye for more than two minutes. In two minutes, they can whoop, jump in the swimming pool when they drown, like, oh my God. What have I done? And then you feel so guilty that you didn't pay attention 100% of the time. So I think it's a matter of, of risk and, and management. I was in a dinner uh, after being with a friend all afternoon. We went for dinner. And then during the dinner, he's like, oh, my God, something is wrong. Uh, Bitcoin is falling. And I'm like, OK. And, and then I open my, uh, my phone. Immediately, I'm checking Nasdaq. Uh, and I'm like, what? Nasdaq is down 3%. I'm like, oh yeah, today was the minutes. I remember because like on Sunday, I knew the Fed would release the minutes on Wednesday. And this was Wednesday night in Lisboa. So I'm like, that's probably something to do with the minutes. Let me take a look because Microsoft doesn't go down 5% in a day. That, that doesn't happen very often. What's going on? Why Google is down minus five, Nvidia minus seven? Like, I really couldn't care less about Bitcoin and I'm a crypto person, right? And well, we ordered the check and I'm like, okay, so bye-bye, have a nice one. I know you want to be trading. And, and he knew and I immediately just like called my mom, like, cause I manage her portfolio. And I'm like, mom, look, we can exit positions right now. We're going to spend a good amount of gas. Like gas was already 270 or something. And I just said, kind of game over if you want to. I'm not going to have the same amount of money you saw this morning in your portfolio because she was super happy with the gains. But I just said, that's it. She's like, no, it's fine. It's OK. You know what to do. So I'm like, all right. So this is three years money that you're allowing me to play with it. But so I am happy yeah, with my it stomach. Out too, no? Yeah, I'm happy with my stomach. But once I'm man managing money from other people, I need to like, hey, this is now your risk, your stomach. Do you have stomach? Because I know I can handle my stomach. So this is between you and... So, Polina, how do I know if I handle, I can handle my stomach? <laughs> this like, is like... If we, stop, if we stop recording and I show you, like, we showed them the, what we did in 